Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. By my estimation, I have done 172 funerals here at Redeemer. It's 172 caskets, 172 services, 172 families in mourning. It's enough to fill a small cemetery just by myself, and I'm just one pastor. 172 people would be a rather good number if it were weekend church attendance here at our little congregation. But instead, it's hard to imagine having an empty church for three services in a row, a whole congregation of people that's missing from life in this world. Among those 172 people were people that I cared deeply about, and also people that I barely knew. There were friends and mentors, and even some students. There were people that I had baptized, people that I had confirmed, people that I did weddings for. There were people that I still miss dearly. Honestly, it's enough to make any pastor not want to do the job anymore. To let people instead take their chances with funeral homes and celebrations of life rather than put in the time, effort, and emotional investment into church services, funeral sermons, and the sacred rites of God's people. But to dwell on the loss is just too much, and it would all be so overwhelming if I didn't know that those people I had buried now live with Jesus. If you've lost a loved one, if their name is on our list today or on our list in years past, you know exactly how that feels. Death has a way of putting things in perspective because all of a sudden, all the earthly things that we are so concerned about melt away in a flash. And all a person's interests, personality, their accomplishments, they don't really matter anymore. Instead, everything comes down to one question that we are desperate to answer on behalf of our loved one. That is, did they believe in Jesus? All of a sudden, faith moves to the forefront. We would trade anything to know for sure about our loved one's faith in Christ because we know that only Christ gives life. Only faith in Christ saves. Only faith in Jesus guarantees an eternal life for those that we love. When a loved one dies, we quickly realize that Jesus is our only hope, both in this life and in the next. Today, the Apostle John gives us a peek into that eternal life in our reading from Revelation today. In it, John sees into the inner workings of heaven, and he sees a multitude of saints clothed in the white robes of Christ's righteousness, gathered around the throne of God in endless worship and ceaseless praise. And when the elder explains to him who they are and where they have come from, he uses a very specific word. It's a basic word in our English language, one that we often overlook, but here in this time and place is a word that holds such great importance for any of us who have lost loved ones. He says, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. These are the ones that are before the throne of God. By using that present tense word, are, the elder reveals to John that the condition of those who die in Christ is not one of future hope or one that is waiting for joy or life, but is rather a present reality, one that is happening even now, even though we cannot see it, and we are not there to enjoy it, at least not yet. Jesus himself paints a similar picture of this in the Beatitudes from the Gospel today. 
For throughout those blessed sayings of our Lord, Jesus continually uses that same little word. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the peacemakers. And perhaps for the most important for us today, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Jesus describes a present reality with his words, a right now blessing that he sees even if we may not. Ask yourself, do you feel blessed in these ways? And sure, during especially this time of the year, we can count our blessings and we can come up with many different examples, but do you feel blessed right now in the things that Jesus describes here? Do you feel blessed when you are persecuted? Do you feel blessed when you are waiting for justice? Do you feel blessed when you are being reviled and slandered by others? Do you feel blessed when you are mourning the loss of a loved one? I don't. In fact, I feel just the opposite. So what gives? Is Jesus lying to us? Talking on some level that we just can't understand? Is he giving us these platitudinal encouragements just to make us feel better in this unrelenting morass of suffering and death that we call earthly life. For those of us who believe that Jesus doesn't lie, these beatitudes about being blessed in these circumstances are rather hard to accept. We believe that what Jesus says must be true, and yet we don't see or feel or experience it in any way. Sadly, the reason for this disconnect is not our Lord Jesus, but rather, once again, is our own sinful condition. When we talk about sin in the church, we're usually talking about sins of commission and sins of omission. Sins of commission are those times when we do what is wrong. We go against God's commandments. We commit a sin. A sin of omission is where we fail to do what is right, specifically towards our neighbor. Those two kinds of sins are usually what we mean when we talk about sin in the church. There is another type of our sin an original corruption of our very nature that sets us at odds with God and even robs us of the comfort that he tries to give us. That original sin is the nature by which we are sinful and unclean, and we have it from the very moment we are conceived, and it separates us from God from the very beginning does not allow us to be close to him, abide by his will, or even love him with our whole heart. And in this particular case, our sinful estate, our nature, even steals away the truth of Christ's word and blessing. We don't see, feel, or experience that which Christ says is absolutely true because we cannot see the reality that Christ sees. Our sinful nature prevents it. That's how far divided we are from the God of life. The good news is that Jesus is not stopped by this sinful nature. In fact, he came precisely to redeem it, precisely to atone for it, precisely to set it right. Jesus' work of salvation is not prevented by our inability to see it, feel it, experience it, or understand it. Jesus doesn't wait for us to figure things out or to get better at believing or obeying before he will do his work of salvation. No, Jesus does everything for us. He does it apart from us, without our cooperation, and then in his divine mercy. 
He gifts it to us. He gives us that forgiveness, that redemption, that eternal life anyway. Jesus declares that we are blessed even when it doesn't look like it. Jesus declares that we are forgiven even when it doesn't feel like it. Jesus gives eternal life even when it still appears that this life is all that matters and that death has the final say. Faith, then, is the believing that Jesus accurately describes things as they truly are. Faith is trusting that Jesus does not lie, that things are exactly as he declares them to be. And this shouldn't be a stretch for us. For Jesus said, let there be light, and there was light. Jesus said, let the earth spin, and the earth spun. Jesus said to the wind and the waves, be still, and they were still. And Jesus says to you, your sins are forgiven, your nature is redeemed, your life is eternal, and you are. It may not look like it, feel like it, and yet it is true because Jesus is true. And you are blessed because you have Jesus. John put it a little bit differently. He said to us, beloved, we are God's children right now. And yet what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when Jesus appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And thus everyone who hopes in him purifies himself as Jesus is pure. Jesus is pure. And so we know that what Jesus says about us is pure and true, even if we cannot see it how Jesus sees it just yet. That is why we anxiously await Christ's return, so that we may see things truly, that we may see things the way Jesus sees them, that everything will be finally set right, that we will no longer be at odds with God in our very nature, but will abide with him in peace and in joy and in life forevermore, just like all those saints who have gone before us are doing even now when we think about those that we have lost there's not one here among us who would take that heavenly existence away from those that we love for as much as we miss them we would not yank them from that peace and joy in order to bring them back to this confounded world instead we rejoice in the truth of god's word that they are before the throne of God, that they are done with trial and tribulation, that they are redeemed and washed by the blood of the Lamb. For all you who mourn this day, grab hold of Christ's promises and his blessings, for they are truly and indeedly yours. Trust in his reality. Death cannot overwhelm us because we know that there is more life on the other side of the grave. Jesus proved it. Jesus does not lie. And his words do exactly what he says they will do. Jesus gives life and he gives it abundantly for all the saints, both here and now and there for eternity. In the name of Jesus Christ, our only hope in this life and the next. Amen.